everybody. Welcome to this episode of Rush Deep Dive. We are talking 1975's Caress of Steel. Uh, and as Patrick has coined this, this is the down the tubes deep dive. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so first we should welcome Patrick. Uh, he's a familiar face on our channel. This is his first deep dive. Thank you for joining us. Donna, myself, and Tim, uh, your usuals here. So uh, before we get into it, I just want to quickly say um, the new exit stage left uh, Rush Funko Pop has um, been announced recently. Uh, my buddy owns a toy shop and he's generously given us a 15% uh, off discount code. Use code Rush Fans. Um, the link is on the screen to pre order that. Um, <clears throat> as always, read briefly from uh, Hugh Symes' Art of Rush and then we will talk about the cover art. All right. It started with a trial and ended with a life sentence. The trial was to establish whether a new, largely untested artist could create a compelling album cover for the band Rush. The trio's third album boasted an album title that James Bond author Ian Fleming would love, Caress of Steel. But it needed a striking cover. Until that point, the Canadian rock group had outsourced its album artwork to its record label. Neil says, we started working on Caressa Steel. We established a method at the time that endures, where I just started sending Hugh the lyrics. He fastened on to the image of the necromancer and the fountain um, of Lamneth. Hugh used a pencil to draw a necromancer with vulpine features. The figure stands atop a spiraling stone staircase. He's encompassed by a voluptuous mist. A human skull peeks out from the folds of his robe, a testament to his dark magic. Nearby, a coiled snake genuflects in respect. The necromancer peers into a transparent prism. Whatever vision he beholds within the glowing object makes him recoil with his arm raised. The illustration almost looks like a tarot card, the kind you pray a fortune teller won't ever draw from the pack. The back cover depicts the fountain of Lamneth as a clifftop waterfall. Eddies of, eddies of water swirl and scrimmage in haste to reach its edge, each petal of water naively eager to hurl itself into oblivion. Next to the waterfall, a gnarled tree with gorgon branches and dragonfoot roots stands sentinel and has overlooked this turbulent scene, ever-changing and yet changeless for an eternity. Hugh also formed the letters of the band's name and album title by hand, then made a mold to cast each letter in acrylic resin. He utilized a vacuum metallizing process to make the letter appear metallic and smelted. To Hugh's delight, Rush agreed not to repeat the same typeface for its album or album titles on future projects. We never had a fixed logo, says Neil. We always use different lettering as a matter of principle on each album. In hindsight, the ever-changing typeface and calligraphy on Rush albums seems fitting for a band that espouses the importance of individuality and progression. If Rush had chosen an emblem akin to the winged totem of Aerosmith or the Python coiled Yes logo, I'll also add the Kiss logo, it would have turned the band into a brand. By adopting Hugh's recommendation that the band that the band resist a fixed logo, the art director secured greater latitude with the design of each LP. The cover concepts could focus on the themes rather than the branding. Neil writes a piece for the fans in each of Rush's tour books, says Hugh. He talks about aspects of the recording process, including anecdotes from the rehearsals, the studio, or even the time developing the stage show and the art for each album project. He once referred to me as the manic Hugh Syme, and years later, noted that I was serving a life sentence as art director for the band. He pauses, I hope my sentence is never commuted. One thing I will add that we didn't cover is that this was originally supposed to be in grayscale. Um, this was not the original uh, color scheme that was used. It was supposed to be uh, the word the dark bluish greenish is um was supposed to be like a darker gray and then um 
this was supposed to be like a lighter gray. Well, yeah, this was this was Hugh Symes' very first, uh, I guess, job with the band, and it turned into a life sentence. So, what do you all think? I couldn't imagine it any other color at this point. And I'm not surprised that Hugh ended up working with the band for years, because isn't that just how Rush were? I mean, I remember very distinctly sitting backstage waiting for a show to start and watching the road crew doing their magic. And half the people in the road crew had been with the band for like 10, 15, 20 years. Their kids were with the band. I mean, it just, it was like this big family. Loyalty meant everything to these guys. And if they liked you and if they liked your work, you were fine with them ad infinitum. And I saw that with so many people that were in their organization, with their record label, with their management. I was dealing with the same people 30 years later that I had dealt with when I was just, you know, starting them out. It's just hard to imagine Rush's crew without Hugh. I mean, he's that closely linked to them. Oh, yeah. And and I love that they have the different logos and fonts for the different years because it, it puts me in that mindset when I'm listening to an album. When mm-hmm. I see the Power Windows font, I'm in a Power Windows mindset. And same with Progressive Steel and all the other albums. Um, Hugh's a genius, and yes. we're so lucky that he partnered with Rush. And he also was really good at channeling Neil. Okay, they really communicated well, okay? He'd bounce an idea off of Neil. I've talked to him about this. He would bounce an idea off of Neil. Neil was like, I don't think so. And he'd bounce an idea off of you. And you would be like, I don't think so. And just watching, I wish I were a fly on the wall, watching these two creative geniuses just doing what they did. Except for Snakes and Arrows. Uh, yeah. well, 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 that's, a, that's a discussion for a different time. Um, he was out, he was one eventually. Yeah. yeah. Uh, no, I mean, to Tim's point, I, um, if you haven't seen the grayscale, you know, of course, I'm going to edit it into this video. I actually like the grayscale a little bit more. I think it's at least a little bit more of an impression on me, but this is definitely, I think, one of the more underrated Rush album covers. Um, you know, again, it's being first and Times obviously changed as technology process. So, um, you know, as to what could have been done, you know, look at roll the bones, for example, or, you know, things like that. But um, yeah, it's, it's definitely, it definitely does pop. And I think that's what is necessary for it. And while we're talking about the album cover, can we just talk about the reception for the album? Because (laughs) I gotta tell you, the critics hated it. They've, oh God, I've got reviews. I mean, uh, plodding, cumbersome, trite, a disappointment. I, okay, and how did you really feel about it, you know? Yeah, don't hold back. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah, this was yeah. not a critic's <clears throat> choice. I mean, Gene Simmons was quoted in Beyond the Lighted Stage. Um, you know, he's, he's like, what the heck is this? Like, they're talking about all sorts of, like, the, the only... The only, I think he said, like the only song that was somewhat relatable or or that he understood was Bastille Day. I think I could be wrong on that, but you know, he definitely was quoted. Um, Didn't he say something about uh, Getty's voice, like he was screaming like a banshee? Or oh yeah, Getty's okay. voice. Yeah, he sounds like a. <laughs> yeah, and if this is what your friends say, I wonder what your enemies yeah, are gonna say. A, you know? a dying chipmunk with a blowtorch up his ass oh, yeah. like that. that was yeah. Terry oh, yeah. Brown and Kim Mitchell they all had different descriptions of yes. yeah. yeah yeah that, yes, well, that was a hamster in overdrive yes. yeah, there, hamster, yes, yeah there you go yeah, yeah. Terry Brown said the dead howling in Hades oh yeah. <laughs> yeah but um but no this was not a critics album and I think part of that is fly by night which we're going to do if I'm not mistaken Um, Fly By Night had some melodic stuff in it. It had some stuff that was radio friendly, whether they were trying to do that or not. That's just how it shook down on this record. And I I was at Mercury at the time. I know we were hoping for something that was mass appeal. 
And whether that's good or bad, record companies always hope there'll be at least one cut that's sort of radio friendly and not exactly. So, so that became really problematic and it became a source of tension at the label. Now, the guys, I mean, the guys are the guys. They're going to do it their way. And that's fine. And I love them for it. But I'm saying from a music industry standpoint, I think people were hoping for X. They got Y and they didn't know what to do with it. Yep, totally. Totally. Uh, From the Um, record side of things, Lakeside Park to me, I was always confused why that didn't seem more radio friendly. (laughs) It seems like a a pleasant song, but short. It could have been on radio. Do you know what happened with that? It why don't Why don't we discuss that one when we yes. discuss like yeah we'll, yes. yeah okay yes. cool. but cool. just um, as an overall thing though yeah um I have always been mystified by why certain tracks when we were doing Madrigal I was like why in God's name did that not get more radio airplay you sure, want to talk yeah. about a radio friendly song but uh, last thing before we talk about the music. The 50th anniversary of this comes up in a couple of years, uh, three years to be exact, 2025. Um, let's just hope uh, here's here's our plea, I guess, uh, that this gets a 50th anniversary, some new cover art and, uh, you know, maybe maybe some audio from the down the tube store. Um, yeah. All right. So, uh, yeah, let's let's get into the music. So um, tonight we're talking. I think I'm going bald, Lakeside Park, the Necromancer, and the Fountain of Lamb Neth, and we're just going to go in order. So, Donna, take it away with I think I'm going bald. Okay. Um, so, here's what I know. When I talked to Getty about it years ago, okay, we're talking like, you know, what, 40, 48, 49 years ago, he told me at the time that he had started to notice the symptoms of alopecia. He was still very young, very insecure. And he said the song related to himself. Now, years later, the story was told completely differently and that version was never spoken of again. I've heard it said that it was supposed to be about Alex. I've heard it said that it was supposed to be about Kim Mitchell. I've heard it said that it was supposed to be about all kinds of people. But frankly, I don't think it matters. I think what really matters is what the song itself is about. And it's a reflection on aging. It's a reflection on going from youth, innocence, looking at the world like, you know, he, there, there's a line in the song about like, once we, you know, looked at the flowers, now we ask for the price of the land, you know? I mean, there was a time when it was just innocent, like, oh yeah, hippies, flowers in your hair, why not? And now it's like, how much does this cost? How much does that cost? Everything has become materialistic. Now the guys are resisting this but they're talking about a person who is worried about losing their youth, losing their vitality, losing their innocence. There's a very interesting little illusion in here and I wish I had asked Neil about it. I never did, but I don't think it's a coincidence. There's a line in here about, I walk down Vanity Fair, memory lane everywhere, Wall Street shuffles there, dressed in flowing hair. In 1974, there was a wonderful album by 10CC, and I know for a true fact that Neil liked 10CC, and there was a song on that album called The Wall Street Shuffle, and it was about this. It was about selling out. It was about, like, becoming materialistic, losing your ideals, and I really wonder. They were on the same label. They went to the same events. Coincidence? I think not. Go listen to the Wall Street Shuffle, and I think you will see that the lyrics are very, very relevant to this song. And Neil does nothing by accident. Right. He had so many different influences. Okay? So when he says, 
My life is slipping away. I'm aging every day. There's that worry. There's that nervousness. But then we get rush. We get, but even when I'm gray, I'll still be gray my way. And when I hear those lyrics, even today, I think about that wonderful song by the Grateful Dead, A Touch of Gray, you know, A Touch of Gray still suits you anyway, you know, I will get by, I will survive. It's almost kind of like the song leads us in one direction where it's going to be, uh, the singer is feeling his age, he's seeing gray hair, I mean, whoever it was written about, or if it wasn't written about anybody, if it was just written about aging. And the person is like, oh my God, I've got gray hair. What if I'm going bald? What if I'm losing this and that? The love song of J. Alfred Prufrock comes to mind. T.S. Eliot, you know, um, I grow old, I grow old. I shall wear the bottom of my trousers rolled. Do I part my hair behind? Do I dare to eat a peach? It, the Allman Brothers album was named after that. Do I dare to eat a peach? My point is, Neil was well aware of the literature about getting old and the fear of getting old and the worry about getting old. And he doesn't want to go there. He understands getting old, but he finishes up with, but even when I'm getting old, I'm going to do it my way. And isn't that just how Rush are? They did things their way. Yeah, totally. It, it's like their way of making that statement. You know, you want us to become more commercial? No. Yeah, like, absolutely. As we, well, I, as and we by age, the way, I know way. a lot of people like to trash the record, trash the song, yada, yada. I understand. Getty's vocals can be a bit shrill in places. But from a historical point of view, this is where we really start seeing the band articulating their philosophy. And I think on that level alone, it's important and it deserves a re-listen. I just feel right about that song myself recently. <laughs> it took me, I was insecure about my balding, so I didn't like the song. And then I finally came around and I just embraced it. It's like, That's exactly what he's saying. He's saying, you know, this does not have to define you. You don't yeah. have to lose your innocence. You don't have to succumb to materialism. You can still do it your way. Yeah. I love I just want to say, oh, sorry, Tim, go ahead. I was going to say, I love the fact that they're making that statement. And yet it's almost like, you know, the slightest bit of middle finger to the, to the, the record company. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No offense, Donna. They didn't mean you, I'm sure. But <laughs> they disguise it with a riff that almost kind of puts you in mind of in the mood or something off the first album. They're like, Oh, okay. This is a song, you know, we can do something with, wait, what's it called? What's it about? What's, you know, I think I'm going bald. I love the fact that they, they combined a deep lyric with kind of a, I don't want to say a boogie woogie riff, but it's a little bit, more akin to the first album yeah. than anything else on this. And, and Getty album. said that Getty said, people don't think we have a sense of humor. We were just trying to have some fun. We, you know, there are some, they, they talked about the fact that there was a song by Kiss that had a similar name. I think Go I'm going blind. blind. Go blind. Mm -hmm. And um, Getty's talking about like how they just wanted to kind of mock it. They wanted to make fun of it. They, uh, He says they were taking the piss out of it, which is a British expression. And I gather Canadian. It is not American. When I heard it on like British cop shows, mm -hmm. I was like, Taking the, is that like taking a piss? No, no. Totally different. And um, taking the piss out of something. And so like, yeah, he was joking around. He was making fun of. It was parody. It was satire with a serious message. Yeah. Uh, two things or two and a half things. Um, first of all, I think this definitely could have been a radio hit if it wasn't for the title of the song. I think the title of the song yeah. gives it gives it the cheese factor or, or whatever. Novelty. It, yeah, it, right. If they called it "Slipping Away" 
you know, or going my gray. life is slipping away or yeah, or going gr- yeah, gray, or my way. going gray, my way. You know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Something and it different. could be an ad for like, you know, uh, the thing you put on your beard guys, you know, yeah. uh, Rogaine. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I think I, he I only just... says, I think I'm going bald once in the song. If I'm, if I'm I think like, um, I'm going twice bald. In a row. Uh, maybe twice. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, the next uh, couple things real quick. Um, the guitar solo and right before the guitar solo, I believe Getty uh, yells, go wild. Is that? I've always heard it as that. Go wild. Yeah. Okay. Um, that was the half point that I wanted to make. Um, the guitar solo, it's a very, I'll use the word cheesy again. It's a very, it's, but it's a very like comical guitar solo. Like Alex is not like, you know, busting his chops on this one. He's just, it's it's sort of melodic. It fits the cheese factor of this song, but it it, it is impressive nonetheless. So but it's uh, almost like he's talking we with his guitar. To get to kind of, yeah. Where, I think they were starting to get to a place where they were just having fun in the studio. Yeah. I mean, the first album, we all know the people, the personnel are very different from the second mm-hmm. album. The second album, Neil has just joined and there's pressure to do a record and do it now. And by the third one, they're kind of like they're getting together as a unit. They're starting to react to each other's cues. They're starting to really form the the new rush, the new phase that we know. And I think they were just having some fun. And why not? I think I think the verse that I the, the one verse that I really love in this piece is once we love the flowers once we would take water but now we ask the price of the land now it must be wine the, the two yep. lines that are prefaced with once are you as a child and it, or and an now. adolescent or yep. whatever versus now which is you grown up and it's all in one verse and it's it's very well written go ahead tim there's something else about the, that solo that i that i just thought of and um you know people that know the band will know the band i'm talking or referring to will know this but those are <laughs> those are very yeah, mm-hmm. ace freely like licks boom mm-hmm. and they toured with them a lot as a matter of fact inside the credits of that they they I say a special hello to ape friendly which i'm guessing is supposed to be ace freely mm-hmm. big macho i'm just going to guess that's gene uh m louis process of elimination has got to be peter chris and mr eisen now paul stanley's real name is stanley eisen so they yep. were buddies with those guys. So Absolutely. It, and they, they, they would have heard Ace do his little, those kind of like, yep. fast, almost like he's laughing with his guitar. Yeah. That's all I got to say. <laughs> it says that in, the, in here. In yeah. The- yeah. Um, a special, it's um, after it says uh, Art Direction, AGI, Graphics by Hugh Syme, and then uh, Executive Production Moon Records. Thanks. Well. Thanks to us for making it all possible. And then it says a special hello to a friendly big macho. Maybe so. I'm going blind here because I don't. Oh, it's right in the middle. It's between. Oh, I see. OK, I got it's it. It's not right. the easiest. Uh, I, I like the calligraphy, but it's not the easiest it's thing to the, read. The easiest I to read, used right. to be able to read it on the CD. Now I can't. I once I could read the CD, but now it must be vinyl. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. So who's up next? Bravo, Tim. Bravo. Yeah. Uh, that would that would be me with Lakeside Park, and I think, I think this yeah, song everybody is. Everybody used to gather there. Is that is that true? Uh, so they say. Um, Once put my phone in do not disturb, so I don't receive another phone call. Sorry. Uh, well, that's just me. With I'm just wanting to know when I'm going to sign autographs. Tell them that. Okay, just... <laughs> um, this song I think is purposefully placed right behind. I think I'm going bald because it deals with a similar ish subject matter right um nostalgia that's really the theme of this song and we'll get into that in a bit but um i think it fittingly opens with a neil drum fill um as this song was you know generally written about neil's childhood at lakeside park there there really is no hidden meaning behind this song as there are some of other rush's songs later in their career you know they're kind of there or or multiple meanings, things to decipher, take it one way or another. Um, but yeah, I mean, Alex then comes in with a riff to remember here, really. I mean, it's it's a, it's a classic Alex riff. And, um, you know, I think we, we'll talk about this momentarily, but, you know, why wasn't this a radio hit? We'll let Donna 
uh, talk about that in a bit. But, um, you know, a lot of these lyrics are just Neil being descriptive about his Lakeside Park, you know, the place where he grew up. Midway Hawkers calling, try your luck with me. Merry go round, wheezing, same old melody. Thousand ten cent wonders, pocket full of silver, key to heaven's door. The chorus, Lakeside Park, willows in the breeze, Lakeside Park, so many memories. Laughing rides, midway lights, shining stars on summer nights. Um, I'm going to read a quote here from... Um, from Rush Visions, I, written by Bill Banasowitz. I still, to this day, don't know how to pronounce his last name. Apologies. Um, I think he kind of disconnected from the band in later years, but there's a very good quote here. Lakeside Park evokes lazy summer days and nights, the kind of life the band had given up in order to, quote, make it. Getty's voice, or excuse me, Getty's vocal has a poignancy that shows that at least part of him misses those carefree days. It's the kind of song to which just about every listener can relate because most of us have a lakeside park of our own. And it just, it makes me think back to my own childhood. Now I didn't have a specific lakeside park, but I had places where I would go to have similar memories, you know, the baseball park um, growing up. I spent, freaking every night at the baseball field uh, whether i was playing or watching um you know having fires at you know my grandparents camp things like that um do you have you have your own lakeside park whether it be quite literally a park by the lake or places you would go as a kid that you know you remember back and and have those nostalgic um you know memories and i think um I think the song goes beyond nostalgia and childhood memories too, in a way, I think, you know, it's saying that, you know, while the magic of our childhood will, will fade as we grow up, you know, the memories live on, right. Those memories live on because, you know, personally, and I think a lot of folks can relate to this, that, you know, a lot of your fondest memories are from your childhood. Um, and I think this song is, you know, wonderful in, in relaying them, you know, days of barefoot freedom, racing with the waves, nights of starlit secrets, crackling driftwood flames, props to Getty for singing these tongue twisters, drinking by the lighthouse, smoking on the pier. Still, we saw the magic was fading every year. Uh, I've never been to Lakeside Park. Uh, fortunately, I will be going next year. I will be playing in the Neil Peart uh, and Glenn Peart Memorial Golf Tournament uh, with some other folks. Uh, and rush fans. Um, so we'll have plenty of information on that and how you can, you know, get involved in the auctions and such, but um, yeah, I will have that opportunity and I'm stoked. Um, guitar solo wise, very upbeat solo solo that, um, you know, drives the memories aspect of this song. It, it really, it really, it's a nostalgic solo. It, it has that vibe. It has that atmosphere to it. Um, and just a quick quote from Neil. In my early teens, I achieved every port kid's dream, a summer job at Lakeside Park. In those days, I, it was still a thriving and exciting world of rides, games, music, and lights. So many ghosts haunt that vanished midway. So many memories bring it back for me. I ran the bubble game, calling out, catch a bubble, uh, prize every time, all day, and sometimes the ball toss game. When I wasn't busy, I would sit at the back door and watch the kids on the trampoline. Dot, 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 I got fired. So <laughs> <laughs> there's that. So um, Donna, real quick, why don't you tell us why uh, you, know, you think maybe this song never made it for radio? Be very honest with you. My recollection is that the folks at Mercury did not know what to do with this record, okay? I think there was an expectation that they were going to get something mass appeal, and when they didn't, and by mass appeal, something with a hit single, and for whatever reason, they did not hear Lakeside Park as a potential hit single. Now, in fairness to the folks at Mercury, this was an era when hit singles were everywhere. <laughs> OK, album rock was still a relatively new format. FM album rock. I mean, the music was completely shifting over from AM to FM. FM album rock was now the big format. And if you didn't have something that was radio friendly and I just 
think that what Mercury was hoping for was, you know, a 10 CC, I'm not in love, or, you know, just sign, you know, Bachman Turner Overdrive, taking care of business. And, and this wasn't it. I mean, there yeah. were some songs on it that could have gotten FM airplay and did, but it just wasn't promotable for the type of record that I think that the record company was hoping for. Do you think this song suffers from the same thing, title, the title of the, of the song, song name? As not, not really. Be able to promote I, it? I think it suffers from the fact that it was on an album that was All this right. big concept album to some degree with long songs. And yeah, I think I'm going bald wasn't perceived as radio friendly, particularly. And I think that Lakeside Park just got overlooked completely. I just wondered if, if the if the location was too specific as opposed to calling it no, I don't so think many memories or something. I really right. do think that they were hoping, like I said, for an I'm not in love or a taking care of business or you okay. know something that was like three minutes of candy. You know what I mean? Just like sure, yummy. Sure. You can sing along with this. You can dance along to it. And that just wasn't Rush. That you know, wasn't one thing I forgot to mention, um, which you know, people may put me in the guillotine uh, like in Bastille Day if I don't. Um, the last verse, everyone would gather on the 24th of May, sitting in the sand to watch the fireworks display, dancing fires on the beach, singing songs together. Though it's just a memory, some memories last forever. One of Neil's yeah. best lines. Absolutely. Um, of Absolutely. course, this highlights a specific day, an event of Victoria Day in Canada. Um, but Again, it, you know, that that could be the 4th of July in the States. Oh, yeah. It could be anything. Yeah, there, there's yes. there's Memorial Day. This is also Memorial Day. I mean, exactly. Is, yeah. This is Neil perfecting his craft. Okay. This is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. For all the people that are like, oh, I would never listen to the first album or, you know, I can't stand the second. Yeah. Please, if you're really right. a fan and I know the people that watch our webcast are. But if you're new to all of this from both a historical standpoint and from the process of listening to the artist as he develops. This has got so many moments where you sit and you say, yeah, there's some brilliance here. There really is. Is it 100% there? No, it's not. But they're still young. They're still working. They're still learning each other's rhythms. They're still developing their craft. And this is so an young important still. song. They were, yep. Yeah, so, so young when they made this album. Me too. That's my yeah. point. Yeah. Without yeah. Caress of Steel, there could be no 2112. Yeah. So. My point. Yeah. You my just point. got done my point for later. <laughs> Tim, yeah. uh, okay. I will I will um, introduce you here with uh, As gray traces of dawn tinge the eastern sky. You're hired. <laughs> I, that, that's, a, that's a good effect for the end of Countdown, too. <laughs> <laughs> the Necromancer. Tell us about the Necromancer. Yeah, the Necromancer, the first of the two epics uh, on one album. Um, the Necromancer is very, very Tolkien um, influenced. I mean, they they obviously were fans. They did Rivendell on Fly By Night, which is very literal, um, you know, about Tolkien. This one changes it up a little bit. I mean, they're, the Necromancer in The Hobbit uh, is actually Sauron. But in this... Um, He's portrayed more as Sauron was in the Lord of the Rings, for those that don't know, um, the, the evil prism eye and, and, and the embodiment of, of Sauron in, in Lord of, by the time you get to Lord of the Rings or the third age of Middle Earth. I'm getting super geeky here. Yeah. Sauron oh. is just merely <laughs> portrayed as a giant eye on a big tower. So all seeing and the prism could also refer to the Palantir which are basically like seeing stones or seeing like a crystal ball where uh, they could communicate with other people or they can see what other people are doing. And there are seven of them. And so, and the fact that there are three travelers, um, it could refer to Sam and Frodo, but also when they come across Gollum, who is not a good guy per se, but there were three of them that were heading to Mordor. And, um, you know, it's very, very much in that realm. Now, when I first heard this album, I didn't know anything about The Hobbit or Lord of the Rings. I just thought that, like, this was when I was just first buying all these Rush albums. 
this was one of the heaviest songs that I was on an album that I owned at the time. Like once it gets to that down, 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 down that and, and the way that Getty sings and brooding in the tower. I mean, there's just so much it, it, he's got. He's an actor. I've said this many times. He's an actor with Neil's lyrics. He gets so into character like Cygnus X1. He's in, you know, he's in the Rasanata. He's going through the black hole. He's screaming because he's scared. Uh, and he gets so into this. I love the opening narration, which I believe is Neil with his voice treated. It is. Yep. Uh, yep. Great traces of dawn. And, you know, the th- I love the three travelers, men of Willowdale. Well, Willowdale is a very <laughs> Middle Earth sounding name, but it's actually a suburb of Toronto. Yeah. And um, yeah, it, it's an amazingly epic song. I love alex's guitar solo it's it's almost like the guitar is crying um you know uh, basically uh i'm trying to think of what section it, it's really as the songs just it, it's kind of a, almost a slow bluesy kind of uh backbeat and he's just like this think here again when they do um exactly yeah. you know it's almost like um years before the way the wind blows it's like yeah rush can rush can be bluesy when they want yeah. to be but they, boy, they, can they ever be heavy on here? And I'm really surprised that this album didn't take 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 hold with you know fans of Black Sabbath and you know the early metal bands because that this is as heavy as anything. Parts of uh, I mean Bastille Day certainly is, and parts of Fountain of Blenheth are too. But um, is you know once you get into that section where it's whatever the effect is that's like. Whoosh, whoosh, and then you can't tell me that didn't influence bands like Metallica. Oh yeah, that's fun. Yeah, oh sure. I mean, it was proto thrash, right? And then, then it ends. The the reformed Bitor, who was the enemy one album hint previous, comes back and saves the day. And the funny thing about it is that I've seen on Discogs that Return of the Prince was released as a single, which is like one verse, no chorus, and then a guitar solo to fade out, but it's like the happiest sounding thing on the album. I hear a little bit of the who here, um, just like down, down, da, down, down. And I, you know, we all know what a big who fan Neil was and what a big, all of them, all three of them. I um, mean, they covered the who, right? So that's coming out a little bit. Um, but yeah, it's, I like it. I like the, the journey it goes on and, you know, it's like on this album, it's like a little compact Epic. It's not a sidelong thing. Um, but yeah, I, I don't, I never had any problem with it. It was a a while before I realized, um, what the three parts were called because my initial, when I first heard it again, it was on that U S mercury cassette that I've talked about. It just said the necromancer and it wasn't until I got archives till I realized what the three parts were called. Not that it really mattered all that much, but yeah, that's my take on it is that it, it's basically like, you know, if you did one thing, he, he read the lyrics of the necromancer and boom, there's your album cover. You know, that's it. That, that's the necromancer. And again, having had the cassette long before I had the vinyl or even the CD, I didn't realize there was a snake in there. I, I, I missed a lot of those details. You got to have the vinyl to really appreciate all of, you know, and, and, and I think you would be the first to say that it's such a, a much bigger canvas to work with, but uh, the necromancer, the first of, you know, well, no, the second, the second of many great rush epics. Well, I was just about to add, it's, it's more or less a sister piece to by and the snow dog. Right. Yeah. And it's but like, the, but like the album much darker. She, well, the, yeah, it's, it's darker and it's, I don't want to say they use use the word refined, but it's more detailed. There's there's more. They added more to it for storing to storytelling purposes. Yeah, there's narra- it's got narration. Yeah, it's got, there's just, know, yeah more bells and whistles. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Yep, yep. Do you think if it didn't have the narration, it might have been a bigger, more popular song instead of putting the narration in the lyrics like they did with twenty one twelve to kind of. I think that was a lesson. Song. I think that was a lesson. They said, you know what? Let's just let's just let the people read the narration and imply mm-hmm. it in the music. And like Neil likes to use the word well, implicit. So I think at that yeah. point, it's like, yeah, let's not be quite so literal and actually speak the narration. Yeah. In yeah. beyond the lighted stage, the guys acknowledge that in some cases they went 
way off the rails and they had to like reel themselves back in sometimes. I mean, I listen to some of their music and I'm like, God, this is amazing. And I listen to other songs and I'm like, I love them. They're my friends. But <laughs> and I think they had the same reaction at the time. It seemed like, yeah, you know, but then later on, looking back on it, maybe a little editing would have been good, you know. Yeah. It's like Alex said in Beyond the Light Stage, I think he, his, he said was, you know, nobody got it. And then he kind of pauses like, I'm not even sure we got it. Yeah. yeah. Like, yeah. it's just. Getty says, I think we were all pretty high when we made that record. And it sounds like it when I listen to it today. I, I just feel that this record and this song and maybe the, uh, the song Patrick's going to talk about momentarily it is a record that you go back in time and appreciate it more than when you, than when it came out. Right. I mean, you go back in time, you appreciate it as, um, you know, a, not a prelude, but what was to come with 2112, Feral the Kings. You Absolutely. needed this record Absolutely. to get to that point. And it's Obviously. a lot like, I was just the same thing with like a record like Tess for Echo. You go back yeah. in time and you appreciate yeah. it more going back yeah. in time. But at the time at the record company, I remember, listening to it and i know that there were people in the room particularly the older guard you know the people that were like in their six fifties and 60s and had been in the industry for a while and really grew up with top 40 radio and they're sitting there like <laughs> yeah mm -hmm. yeah they're like what the yeah. hell is this <laughs> yeah but you know i'll be people, i'll be people... honest i i was gonna say i'll be honest I avoided the Necromancer and the Fountain of Lamneth for the longest time yeah. just because there's so much rush material, but I just, I never got to them. And once I finally did, I friggin' love them. I mean, obviously I don't think they're 2112 or Hemispheres or, or whatever, but they're still really awesome. And I would just suggest you go back in time and listen to these. And just well, the last thing is really awesome. Since Patrick is the new guy here tonight. I mean, don't we have to <laughs> let Patrick just. Yeah. Wrap it up I was, strong. I was just going to say this album took 18 years to certify gold. It didn't go no. gold till 1993. It doesn't but, even surprise me. But, but, even, but it means me. people kept, like me, getting into them in 80, 87, 88. People sure. kept discovering them and kept buying them along the way. So you might say it took 18 years to go gold. I said, yeah, such a weird album sold a half a million copies. So there's yeah. two ways of looking at it, right? Yeah. All right, Patrick, the Fout of Lamb Neth. All right, here we go. Um, so I, I think I'll well, kind of start with this, kind of what we were just talking about a little bit with how it's, to me, this song is just absolutely essential listening for any Rush band because it is so important to their career trajectory. It's It shows that evolution, you know, this album is the evolution from, shows the evolution from, you know, the more straight hard rock to to the prog rock. And we've talked about by tour and just now the Necromancer. And I feel like with those songs, it's like, they're dipping their ankles into the prog waters. They're going up to their knees a little bit. This is the cannonball. This is the, we're going off the high dive and it's sink or swim. And we're just going to find out what we're made of in this moment. And does this song have some, some flaws and warts in it? It, it does. I, and I think they've acknowledged it over the years. But I'm just continually impressed by how ambitious this song is for the age at which they were doing this. Forget how, how young they were. And this is a 20-minute song that occupies the entire side, too. And as you guys alluded to, I don't think you get 2112, Hemispheres, Xanadu, any of these songs without the experience that they gained from the founding of Lemnath. If you listen to this song and then 2112 back-to-back, -back, you can hear the growth. In there, It's crystal clear. This song kind of feels like almost six separate parts to me kind of pushed together. When you listen to 2112, that is a complete song. It is crisp. It is clear. It is concise. They cut the narration out. They put it in the album liner so fans can read it. And it just makes it feel just more, uh, the song just feel, um, feel tighter. Um, that's kind of my overview of just why I love this song. And, it, and it's so important. Uh, I think it's so important. As for the song itself, it you know, it's a long song, but I guess if I had to sum it up, it's it's an epic story that chronicles a man's life from birth to death who realizes life is about the journey, not the destination. Um, that, to me, is the simplest way I could distill this this 20 minute epic. <laughs> Would what that make got? the album come full circle with 
I think I'm going bald, Lakeside Park, things we already talked about thematically, you know? Yeah, I, I think... You know what I'm saying? I think you can see it. Absolutely. And I think I think that's what it is in this album. All the ideas and the thoughts are there. It just, it just wasn't as concise and, and tight and clear as they did it in later albums where they really where they really figured it out and it's just i this is what i geek out about the evolution of a band listen to their stuff in order so you can really feel the trajectory as they're they're putting it together um so that's kind of my overview uh we got six parts for this you know we could be here all night so i'll just touch on each part um just a little bit briefly um we got part one in the valley and just kind of, a, kind of a quick overview. To me, this is the, the protagonist is born. And from a young age, he has a desire to travel to the top of this mountain in the east to find the fountain of Lamet. And he wants to seek life's hidden answers. And it really nicely kind of sets the table and telling us what the, the starting point is for the journey. Um, I think it's got some really great 12 string acoustic guitar by Alex that kind of builds up nicely. And then we get kind of that main theme um, that we later hear in part six. And I think that's one of the things that kind of hurts this album is a little bit is there's not as much repetition of some of, of the of different themes and parts. I think some of the later epics do a better job of kind of reusing some themes to kind of help orient the listener a little bit. So again, they learned what they figured it out. They learned what they were doing. Um, um, since this is a long song, Ryan, real quick, do you, do you want me to let you guys like jump in and talk about each part as we go, or do you just want to I would say go you through just, each part? You go, just go. <laughs> just yeah. go? <laughs> just go. All right. Part two is kind stay, of No, I should say stay, go. <laughs> Work, no. Um, first That's done. <laughs> this um, part two, Didax and Narpets. This, this part, the first few times I heard it, Kind of jarring was like, kind of got a little whiplash. Like, is this? Am I still listening to the same song and band here? Um, but to me, I think it represents the rebellious and chaotic teenage years of the of the protagonist as he argues with his teachers and parents, which we can all relate to. Um, I'm not sure that it's, you know, conveyed by the lyrics in the song super crystal clear to the listener those first few times. But um, you know, I think if you're a a diehard band who really, you know, dives into this and gets into the nitty gritty. People figured that over out over the years. Um, and I know Getty is technically yelling some yelling to these words during this part, but to me, this is essentially a Neil drum solo, and it's an incredible solo. I, I love how just kind of like frenetic it is, and it's just I can't help but crank that up on the volume when I'm listening to it. It's definitely an air drum moment uh, for me. I, I kind of wish he would have brought it back maybe and, and better bands might know better than me. If he, I would have loved for this to get brought back in a drum solo in the later years. Um, I don't think he ever did, but if he did mention it in the comments, um, I love that part. Um, for me, this is where the song really takes off. Part three, no one at the bridge. This is absolutely, this part is beautiful. It is, it is so, it's almost cinematic how much of a picture Neil paints with the lyrics. This is a part that I wish they would have brought back in a live medley. Maybe later at some point, like they did some of the medleys on like the Moving Pictures Tour, Grace Under Pressure, uh, R30, I think they did a medley. Um, this one to me is absolutely right for a medley, but didn't happen. Um, so in this part of the song, our protagonist has begun his quest now traveling by boat. Uh, no reason is given as far as I can tell, but the crew has mutinied against him and they left him tied to the ship's mast and abandoned him. That's that's kind of bleak. It's not going well for our, for our guy here. Maybe he should have stayed in the valley. Um, but um, I, I think, Tim, you alluded to it earlier, like how great Getty is at almost at acting. He's not just singing these parts of the songs. And when he hits that high note, around like the eight minute mark for scream out desperation. I feel the desperation in that moment. I feel like Getty Lee is actually strapped to, to the bridge of the ship and it's not going well for our guy. And 
I'm feeling for him here. Yeah, you don't you don't picture a guy in a studio standing in front of a microphone with a pair of headphones on. No, I'm I'm seeing it. I'm visualizing yeah. this moment, and that's yep. a, um, a tribute to Neil's as always incredible lyrics and, and Getty's performance. Um, not to be outdone, I think Alex is what I would call kind of like a bluesy solo to me at, around the 840 mark. These times are based on Spotify for anyone who cares. Um, I, I love this part of the song. It is beautiful. It is haunting. Um, again, I wish they would have brought it back later. Uh, part four. And I say it. Everyone's favorite part, right? Right? <laughs> I think this part of the song probably gets kind of talked down on sometimes, but I think this is this is I think these Neil's lyrics by Neil are genuinely sweet and tender. And I think it's a really heartfelt performance um, by Getty. Um, this is the part in the story where the our confused protagonist has survived the crash, thankfully, and he's in the wreckage of the ship, but he quickly discovers and falls in love with a woman who tempts him to settle down and stay. But you know, the temptation isn't enough. He's got to get to He's got to get to that fountain, so he decides to to take off. Um, but to me, this is really Neil's probably first love song, and but he, you know, it does it differently than than other bands and lyricists have. You know, would, would do it. he does it in a. It's hard. It's it's enclosed in one long song. But to me, if you're kind of thinking about them as separate parts, this is really the first Rush love song, in a way. And yeah, I. I and again, they're they're all so young. I think it's genuinely just sweet and innocent. And um, and uh, Alex just again, the soft. I, what I would describe as like a soft slide guitar, kind of starting around the eleven twenty minute mark, is to me some of the most beautiful playing he's ever done. Like I get chills on my arms when I'm listening to this part of the song. It's to me, it's it's that good. Um, and then part five, the Bacchus Plateau. And our protagonist has lost sight of himself and what is important. And he has abandoned his dream in favor of drinking a lot of wine, apparently, is, uh, is how he's passing his days. And um, this is a really fun, just a really kind of fun, bouncy, joyous part of the song. Alex has like a really meaty riff around the 1342 mark. And um, again, Getty's vocals, he's just really selling it. I feel like I too am, am soaked in wine and just wasting away, you know, in, in some lost place of, of temptation. And, um, you know, Neil, so good with words. Um, I love the title. Uh, Bacchus is the Roman god of wine. He's drinking a lot of wine. And Plateau to me is, our protagonist has plateaued at this point in his life. He's, it seems like he's kind of, he's just kind of stagnant. He seems to have kind of accepted his fate and failure and, and given up. Like, we're not sure he's going to, sure he's going to make it to this fountain. Um, but thankfully in part six, he rallies. And um, now to me, I want to know what you guys think about this part of the song. My read on kind of this end part of the song is that he has reached the fountain he can hear the dancing waters. He's reached his goal. He's achieved his dream. But when he gets there, he doesn't feel anything. No sense of accomplishment. He realizes life is about the journey, not the destination. He is forever at the start, and he needs another journey. So the cycle begins again. Another possible read could be it's a metaphorical mountain, and he's he's actually dead or nearing death, approaching heaven. I've, I've seen that thought to the end. Um, so I'd love to know what you guys think about kind of the end of the song there. What are you, what are you thinking? Well, what you just said got me thinking to prime mover. Um, that is obviously revisited. Yeah. That's later. Arrived, yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> 12 years later. But if, if you're also thinking in terms of other songs on the album, you've got Lakeside Park with the nostalgia and the memories that still last. You've got, I think I'm going bald with insecurity about what will the future hold? What will happen to me when I get older? It's again, it's the artist's journey and the uncertainty of the journey. This is only their third album, only their second album together. And they're still 
no pun intended, finding their way. There you go. And like with the band, it's like make an album tour. The cycle starts again. Make an album tour. So kind of works out there too. Um I, I love the kind of the triumphant um return of that musical theme from part one. And then just the final little stanza of lyrics there, starting with I'm in motion. Again, goosebumps on my arm, hair raising chills. It's beautiful. Neil is a, I just his lyrics just sing to my soul the way he writes it's it's beautiful i love it and what i'm hoping when we do deep dives on some of the really really popular albums it's like yeah you know the people that are watching are like yeah absolutely but when we're doing the ones that maybe aren't as popular first of all isn't it amazing that there's so much to say about it but second of all we're hoping you'll re-listen and let us know in the comments what you think because I got to tell you, there's albums that I listen to, and then years later, I come back, and it's like a whole new experience for me. Mm-hmm. And not just Rush albums, I'm saying in general. So if that's your experience, too, mm-hmm. yeah. I mean, re-listen. Tell us what you think. We read every comment. That happens with me with Rush albums all the time. I, know I haven't listened to this song, whatever. But, um, yeah, I mean, we can we can wrap there. Um, <clears throat> you know any any like donna said any thoughts viewers have on this record you know please put them in the comments um but really i mean albums like this that you know get a poor reputation in the rush community or you know albums such as crest of steel that you know you haven't listened to in a while whatever we said it on test for echo we said it on presto we said it on hold your fire go back and listen to this record um I think, uh, you know, I think I, I think, you know, I can speak for the group. Um, you know, we think you'll have a change of heart because there's good material on on this record. Just give it a chance. All rush is good rush. You just have to give it a chance. Um, so uh, we'll wrap there, and uh, next month we'll be doing Fly By Night, uh, another record from the same year that Teresa Steel came out. So uh, with that, we'll, um, yeah, we'll wrap. Take care, everybody. Thank you.